I'm gonna get started here. Um, if other people join along the way, that's great. So we're doing Get Buzzing About Bees today. It's really timely because of course yesterday was beautiful, um, 20 degrees out. So the bees are um, starting to come about, starting to hatch. Um, and now's the time to think about how to attract those bees to the yard. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. I hope everyone can see the uh, next slide that I switched to. If someone can just give me a yes in the chat box, that would be great so I know everything's okay. Okay, good. All right, so here's um, how this presentation is gonna go. We're gonna start um, with a little introduction about myself and why, um, why I'm the one talking about bees and how I'm qualified to do that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, Wild Birds Unlimited because of course they are the host of this presentation today so I want to just say a few words about them um, and then we'll get into the bulk of the presentation so uh, we'll talk about um, solitary bees, social bees, all the bees <laughs> really um, and how we can attract them to our yard which is I feel like what most people came here for um, so stay tuned for that and then at the end, I'm hoping uh, most people can stay until the end because we will be doing a draw for a gift card to Wild Birds Unlimited, which is great. Um, so I have everyone's names in a bowl here um, and I'll be drawing one at the end to win that gift card. All right, so let's get started here. This is our first section. <laughs> yes, goody, I agree. All right. So a little bit about me. My name is Alana. Um, I have many hats that I wear, um, but one of them is that I am a staff at the Wild Birds Unlimited in Edmonton. Um, some of you may have seen me before, um, recognize me from the store. Um, I love working at the store. I'm so lucky to work for such a great, great place. Um, I am also a student. So I'm meaning I'm going into my fifth year of environmental and conservation sciences at the University of Alberta. Um, I focus particularly on how humans interact with the environment. Um, so why they do the things they do, how we can change behaviors. Um, of course, lots of stuff about climate change. Um, so yes, that's kind of my, uh, that's the bulk of my life right now is school. I just finished my last um, exams last week. Um, I also was an intern for the Edmonton and Area Land Trust, if anyone is familiar with that organization. They do a lot of great work um, conserving important natural areas in the Edmonton region. Uh, so if you're interested at all about conserving land or starting to volunteer with an environmental organization, the Land Trust is a really great place to start and a really, really great place for resources. Um, they have lots of resources about pollinators and bees. So definitely check them out too. I have worked there for the past three years and it's a really rewarding place to work as well. Um, and then lastly, I have been doing work um, with bee hotels a lot this past year because I actually received a grant from Nature Canada um, to uh, give presentations about bees, solitary bees, building bee hotels, um, and how to attract them to your yard. So I've been doing this for a while. I really like bees. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, or even after the presentation, everyone should have my email. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about bees always. <laughs> Okay, and then I also just wanted to talk about Wild Birds Unlimited just really briefly. I know all of you know about it already. Uh, that's how you heard about this presentation. Um, but I just wanted to say that Wild Birds Unlimited is a really special place because not only is it um, a retail store, but it's also um, a place where you can go to talk uh, to others who love nature. Um, the owners, Jordan and Aaron, I'm so thankful for them. They make the store is such a great place to work um, and I'm really thankful that they're allowing me to give this presentation today. Um, if you haven't been to the store recently, we are um, doing the curbside pickup and deliveries right now because of course uh, going into the store is a no-go for now. Hopefully soon we'll be open again, um, but we have everything you need for your backyard nature products. So 
reach out to us at any time uh, by phone or email um, or our online store. Okay, let's get into the bulk of the workshop because I know that that's what everyone came for. Um, so we're going to talk about different kinds of bees um, and how to attract them to your yard. Uh, for people who just joined, um, we are going to do um, some interactive components. Um, so if you are um, wanting to engage, you can either use the chat box. I'm hoping everyone can see the chat box and can try that out at some point. Um, and the other way you can engage is by unmuting your microphone. Um, so preferably at the end of um, a slide or, you know, in breaks and talking um, so that I can try and get through the information. Uh, and then, yeah, feel free to ask questions at any time. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so here's what I meant about the interactive nature of this presentation. So I'm going to start with how many species of bees are there in Alberta? I know this is um, a really common question I get, so I want everyone to take a guess. Um, if you can type your answer into the chat box, I'll give you about 30 seconds, maybe longer, um, to take a guess as to how many species of bees you think there are. Okay, I see 50, 120, 30, 230s, 30 to 40, nice, 40, lots of question marks, I love it. Um, Give everyone a few more seconds. <clears throat> 10, 70, 71 seconds here. Anyone else wanting to guess? Okay, oh, 50. Um, here comes a big reveal, drum roll. 375 and counting. Um, so we actually have more than that. We're almost at 400 now. Um, but yes, we have 375 species of bees in Alberta. Um, that is a shocking amount of bees. <laughs> I love all of the responses in the chat, the, the surprise, yep. Um, so there are many different types of bees and we're going to kind of classify um, how the different species fall into different groups. Um, so I'll start off, here are the different types of bees in Alberta. I'm just kidding, but I really like this joke, so I'll give you a second to read it. I like friends who eats pests, but need a little more personal space. Technically not a bee, but still, I really like this graphic. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll go on to the actual different categories of bees now. Okay, um, so when someone says bees, um, I'm not sure, can, can you guys see my um, mouse when I point to something on the screen? Can someone give me a yes in the chat box if you can? Okay. Um, so when I say bees, um, it really falls into two main categories. So we have social bees and we have solitary bees. And within that, there's different types. So the social bees are the ones that we normally think about. Um, the really cute yellow uh, and black honeybees and bumblebees. So these are the, the really big ones. We're really used to seeing them. When someone says bee, that's what we think of. Um, but we also have the solitary bees, which don't get as much attention um, as the other bees, but I would say they are just as, if not more important than the social bees. Um, and those guys are broken down into the tunnel nesting bees and the ground nesting bees. I'm going to go a little more in depth um, into these different types in the next slide here. Okay. Um, so the main difference between the two groups, solitary bees and social bees, as I mentioned, the social bees are the ones we typically think of. Um, they are the yellow and black ones. Sometimes they're fuzzy, um, usually striped. They're quite large. They're the ones, uh, let me see, what, what would it be? Similar to probably like 
the size of an eraser on the end of a pencil. Um, so they're usually quite large. Um, they live in hives. They have a queen. Um, and that's why they're aggressive. They're aggressive because they're trying to protect the queen. That's really their goal. Um, so that's, that's why they sting. Um, they're pretty good pollinators, but they're actually not as efficient as solitary bees. Um, so solitary bees are much smaller. Some of them are um, like think the size of like a mosquito's body. They don't have like long legs like that, but um, they can be like super, super tiny. Um, and they, they are actually way more common in Alberta um, than social bees. So solitary bees are looked over a lot, but they are, um, they are the, the majority of the bees we have here. Um, so something cool about them uh, is that they live on their own. They don't live in a hive. Um, so lots of people um, think that by attracting solitary bees to their yard, they might be um, encouraging a hive in their yard, but that's not the case. They live on their own. Um, they don't come in groups. Some, some bees, um, some solitary bees will uh, kind of nest together. Um, just because they are able to find um, nesting sites that are suitable um, in the same place, but they're not like hive nesting bees um, where they all kind of work together. They're all on their own, which is why they're called solitary bees. Um, they're way less aggressive, um, and that's because they don't have a queen to protect. Um, they don't need to sting. Some species of solitary bees actually don't um, have stingers at all, uh, so lots of people are concerned about, oh, if I encourage um, native pollinators, solitary bees to come to my yard, um, I'm worried about my child getting stung or my dog getting stung. Uh, with solitary bees, you don't have to worry about that because they are not aggressive at all unless you're going out of your way to harm them or their eggs, then you're not at risk at all. Um, they can also be lots of different colors, which is really cool. There's green ones, blue ones, black ones. Um, lots of the solitary bees don't even look like bees at all. They look more like flies. Um, so lots of people have a tough time distinguishing them and it's really hard without a microscope actually to tell species apart. So um, yes, every time uh, you go outside and see something that looks like a fly, beware, it might be a bee. Um, and they are much more efficient pollinators, so that's why we're trying to attract them to the yard. If there's any questions about solitary and social bees, feel free to either unmute your mic or um, type your question in the chat box. Okay, <clears throat> so I just wanted to show a breakdown of how many solitary bees there are and how many social bees there are. Um, so as I said, we're mostly made up of solitary bees in Alberta. Um, actually only 2% of the bees we have are um, honeybees and bumblebees. And that's in terms of the number of species. So not in terms of um, like the, the frequency that you'll see these bees, because of course we see honeybees and bumblebees all the time, um, but we actually have way, way more species of solitary bees. So. That can include leaf cutter bees, mason bees, mining bees, carpenter bees. Has anyone seen carpenter bees before? Um, the ones that like will burrow into the wood. You, you start seeing little holes being drilled in, <clears throat> um, perhaps into your deck. I'll wait to see if anyone um, has seen them. Just type yes in the chat box if you have. <clears throat> um, so yeah, they're really cool. They are the only um, the only bees that uh, have mouthpieces that can uh, bite through the wood. So the rest of the bees um, have to find already made cavities, uh, whereas the carpenter bees can actually drill their own holes. Um, so yeah, that's really neat. I see a question here. Uh, Mildred asked, aren't bumblebees also solitary bees? Um, so they can live solitary lifestyles, uh, but they are considered a social bee because they will interact with other bumblebees. Um, you can also get a nesting structure um, for bumblebees. So bumblebees actually nest underground. Uh, so you can get a bumblebee house. Um, it's kind of a, um, 
It looks like a regular bird nesting box a little bit, but um, you bury it under the ground and you put some cotton in there, and that's actually how they nest. Um, so they can be, they can live solitary lifestyles, but they are considered um, a social bee. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, and then if we think back to um, our chart here, I'll go back. We looked at the difference um, between the social and the solitary. Now we're going to look at um, the tunnel nesting and ground nesting species and the difference between those. Um, so tunnel nesting species are the ones that live um, in bee hotels. Um, so we're going to talk about bee hotels in just a little bit here, but I'll show you an example of a bee hotel um, if you haven't seen one before or if you just need a refresher. So this is a bee hotel. Um, you probably have seen other ones available at garden centers, um, probably Costco, I've seen them there. Um, other stores, they're available for sale. Um, so bee hotels um, are for those tunnel nesting bees. Um, they are not as common as ground nesting species. So there's far fewer species of tunnel nesting bees than there are ground nesting species. Um, but the ones that we do have, it's really important that they have a place to nest. Um, so that's the purpose of the bee hotel. Uh, and then our ground nesting species like to dig holes down into the dirt. Um, so they, that's what they do. They push the dirt all up and make a tunnel down into the dirt um, and they'll lay their eggs there. So they don't live in the dirt, but they do nest in the dirt. And that's the same with the tunnel nesting species. They don't live in tunnels and trees. Um, they just lay their eggs there. They are solitary, so they don't really live anywhere. They're um, kind of nomadic, I guess. Um, and they, yeah, they just nest either in the ground or in tunnels. So that's the main difference between the two types of species. Any questions? Okay, feel free to ask at any time. Oh, here we go. Uh, so Carol said, do they create the tunnels or find tunnels that already exist? Um, so the tunnel nesting species have to find tunnels that already exist because they don't have the mouthpieces um, to be able to create their own tunnels unless they're carpenter bees. That's the only exception. Um, so mason bees, leafcutter bees, they all have to find tunnels in wood that already exists. Um, so they'll look for decaying trees, um, holes in fence posts, like anywhere they can find tunnels that already exist, that's where those tunnel nesting species go. Um, and then for the ground nesting species, they can actually dig into the ground. They find really soft soil or sand, um, sandy soil, not actual sand that would just all collapse. Um, but they, they are capable of creating uh, tunnels down into the ground, those ground nesting species. Exactly, yeah. So bee hotels do help the tunnel nesting species population. Um, because in the city in particular, if you think about um, like new neighborhoods, uh, they have all of those tiny little saplings, right? Um, and that's, that wood, first of all, is too dense for the bees to um, make cavities in at all. Um, and second of all, they're too small. The diameter of the tree itself is far too small. Um, they need a really long tunnel to be able to lay their eggs in. Um, so if you think of older neighborhoods, um, like near the university, there's lots of really huge old trees that are, um, you know, softer wood because they are older. It's, it's easier for the, the bees to find cavities in those types of trees. Um, so in the city, of course, with fewer trees, it's really, really important to have the bee hotels. Okay. Um, Yes, Carol, I'll get to the question about the placement of the bee hotel in just a few slides here. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few ways you can help the bees and then I'll go um, more specific into those different options um, in the coming slides. Um, so the main ways you can help bees, you can make or buy a bee hotel. Um, I'm going to talk about what makes a good bee hotel really shortly here. 
Um, another one that is <laughs> very contentious is uh, leaving some of your dandelions alone. Um, so I know lots of people don't like dandelions, um, lots of people consider them a weed, uh, which yes, I understand they are invasive and they can take over entire areas. Of course, I don't want that to happen to you. Um, but if you just leave a patch of them, um, it's a really, really important early source of food for bees. Um, so they're one of the first flowers that bloom in the spring. Uh, and when everything else isn't blooming, they need, they need pollen, they need the nectar. Um, so keeping just a few dandelions in your yard is a really important way um, to help the early bee population survive. Um, so that's a really important way you can help bees. Another thing is to leave some empty soil patches, which again, I know is not um, super nice in terms of uh, nice backyard landscaping, um, but leaving some open soil patches allows for um, bees to um, nest into the ground. So those ground nesting species will be able to burrow much, much easier into open soil patches compared to um, a grassy backyard or um, rocky or any other kind of backyard. So leaving some open soil patches is actually really important. Um, it makes it a lot easier for those ground nesting bees. Some of you may have seen, um, this, some of you may have experienced uh, when you have like a sheet of drywall or a sheet of plywood just laying on the ground for a long time. It kills all of the, the grass beneath it and it becomes really, um, the soil becomes really soft underneath. So uh, sometimes if you lift the wood up, you'll find that, oh, there's a swarm of bees, bees here. And that's just because um, the soil's soft and they needed that open patch of soil to be able to nest. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's always interesting. I know um, they had that at the zoo, uh, the Edmonton Valley Zoo last year. They, they had a whole patch of soil where whole bunch of ground nesting bees had taken up residence there. So um, we have a question from Elizabeth. If you have mulch on top of the plain soil, is that open enough? Um, I guess it depends how much mulch you have really, uh, because if it's, you know, a couple inches layer of it, they won't be able to get through. Um, if it's just kind of a, a nice sprinkling of mulch on top, though, that would be fine. Um, but yeah, that, I hope that helps. Um, and then Monica said, do bees lay eggs all summer or only at certain times? I am coming up to that in just a minute here, Monica, hang tight. Um, and then the last thing is planting native plants, um, that bloom throughout the year. So the bloom throughout the year part is super important, um, because it provides a food source for bees all year long. Uh, lots of the, the plants we plant, um, they bloom in, you know, June, July, and then in August they start to die off. Um, but it's really important to have some of the the species that will bloom in late August um, and even early into September. So um, I see a question from Mildred about minimal tillage. Wouldn't tillage interfere with established nests? They have new nests every single year. Um, so as long as you're tilling in early spring, the, um, the bees will have already hatched, um, so it won't affect them. Uh, I tend to do it in about May, like right about now is, is when the bees are starting to hatch. So um, I try to wait until I know um, the bees will have been hatched already uh, before I do uh, till or uh, make new open patches so that you don't affect nests. Uh, I hope that also answers your question. Another question from Wojtek. Um, do ground nesting bees have to deal with lots of tiny predators and flooding during rainy weather, or do they solve that using some maze patterns? Um, yes, they do have to deal with lots of other predators in the ground for sure. So um, ants is a big one because ants will eat like everything. <laughs> um, and if the ant um, colony starts nearby, um, a, a tunnel nesting or a ground nesting species of bees nest, um, they'll just eat the eggs and they'll eat the pollen that the mom leaves there for the eggs. So they do have to deal with a lot of predators for sure. 
Um, they do, um, from my experience, they don't use maize patterns, um, but like other, other species do. I mean, that's their adaptation. Um, so yeah, bees, not that I have experienced, they don't use maize patterns. They'll just dig straight down and start laying their eggs. Okay. All right, we're going to talk about bee hotels now because, um, of course, that's one of the really effective ways to help tunnel nesting species in your yard. Uh, I apologize. You probably hear my birds in the background. If you hear that cheeping, they're very loud and I can't get them to stop. So <laughs> just uh, bear with me as they fly about. Um, okay, here's another interactive question. Who has seen, heard of, or has a bee hotel already? Maybe up in their yard, in the neighbor's yard, saw them at Costco. Type your, um, type your answer into the chat. Oh, I see Rose has one. Oh, Elizabeth has two. Laurel has one. That's amazing. Lots of bee hotels. I've heard them and seen them, but don't know how to use them. Okay, Christy, we will help you out with that. Um, Michelle has one, wants to know how to maintain it. If you're in luck, I'll talk about that. Uh, had two of the plastic ones, not a great experience. Yes, and I'll talk about why. <laughs> okay, perfect. Tim has one, perfect. Okay, uh, feel free to keep type. Oh, who <laughs> can object to the sounds of birds chirping? I agree. I mean, we are all wild bird lovers, I think, here, so pet birds are also good. I have two budgies. Okay. So bee hotels come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, so here's just a few of the pictures that I found of different, uh, different types of bee hotels. Um, the We're going to talk about what makes a good bee hotel and what makes a poor bee hotel. Um, the one that I want you to keep in mind for now is this one here. Um, this is the one that they have been selling at Costco for the past couple of years. Um, and I'm going to talk about why this bee, bee hotel in particular is not, not great for bees in Alberta. It is good for bees in other places, but here um, it just doesn't do the trick. And I will talk about why in just a moment. Heard but don't have one. Scouts have been posted in St. Albert Red Willow Trail System. Yeah, that's right. So um, St. Albert Scouts did a big project with the Edmonton and Area Land Trust. Um, I think it was two years ago now. Um, and they used the blueprints that the Land Trust provided to make sure that the bee hotels were up to standard for Alberta bees. So yes, there's a whole bunch of them in St. Albert and that was a really awesome project. I think they put up like 73 of them. It was pretty crazy. Okay, um, what is the point of a bee hotel? So I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, it's for those tunnel nesting bees um, to lay their eggs. It's not actually a home for the bees. It's really a nursery. Um, so that's why I call it a hotel is because the, the mother bee doesn't actually live there. Um, so that's why I don't call it a house. Um, it's really not a house. They, they just lay their eggs. The best word for it would be a nursery, is really what it is. Uh, just give me a second here. Oh, Michelle said, we have the Costco one and that's almost full. That's really awesome. Um, I'm glad it's working for you. There are a lot of people who have had miserable, <laughs> miserable um, experiences with them. Um, so I'll talk about why that is. Uh, if it's working for you, that's wonderful. I'm really glad. Um, but I will talk about uh, why physiologically it doesn't work for the bees. Um, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, bee hotels are especially important in urban areas uh, because there are fewer trees and they're much smaller again so the diameter isn't long enough for them to make a tunnel to lay all of their eggs. Bees can lay up to 15 eggs in one tunnel. Um, so that's a whole bunch and they need a lot of space to be able to do that. Uh, so if the tree, if the tunnel isn't long enough, they aren't able to do that. Um, sometimes they will split up um, their eggs into like two tunnels or two or three around. Um, so you'll see sometimes in bee hotels, I'll just show you here. 
sometimes um, the same mother will lay her eggs in these two tunnels, for example, though. She'll lay them uh, like five here and five there, um, just because sometimes even these tunnels aren't long enough. Okay. Um, yeah, so finding old trees or natural cavities in the wood is pretty difficult in cities. Um, one thing you can do if you have um, a stump in your backyard, like you had to have a tree removed um, and you have a stump that's just left behind, you can drill some holes into that stump. So just grab a drill um, and some relatively long drill bits, four or five inches, um, and just drill holes into the stump and that will help your solitary bees tremendously. Um, so that's one thing you can do as well. You could see that um, here in this uh, log someone took out of their yard and just drilled holes into it. Um, so that's, that's an awesome idea too. Yeah, so Mildred said what size of drill. Um, so the bit uh, should be quite small. Um, so I have a blueprint um, for building bee hotels that tells you exactly what um, what diameter of drill bit you need to use to make sure it's suitable for Alberta bees. So I will send that out in an email afterwards um, with some other resources too. Okay, so um, this goes back to uh, the question that I think it was, was it Monica asked um, about yeah, when bees lay their eggs. Um, so this is kind of a timeline of what happens um, throughout the bee's life cycle, I suppose. Um, so in the summer, that's when they're laying their eggs. They lay their eggs um, mainly in July and August, but depending on how warm it is, you could get some laying happening in May as well, um, and some even into, se into September, um, depending how warm it is. Once it starts to get cold, you can see the second step fall. Some bees are still laying the eggs, but most of the mother bees are starting to die um, because it's too cold. That's simply what it is. Um, the solitary bees have a really short life cycle because the, the adults don't survive in the winter. It's just the babies that will. Um, so lots of them start to die off as soon as that first frost hits. Um, so most, most eggs are laid before um, before the fall. And then in the winter, um, the baby bees will live inside of either your bee hotel or inside of their natural nesting cavity in a tree. Um, and they grow there all winter. Um, so the mother will leave a food source for the babies. I'll show you that in the next slide here. Um, and that's how they are able to grow throughout the winter. Um, there is a question that comes up a lot um, it's freezing out, it's minus 30. Should I bring my bee hotel inside so they don't die? No, <laughs> you shouldn't. Um, and that's because if you do, the bees are like, oh, cool, it's spring already. I'm gonna hatch. Um, and then you're gonna have uh, upwards of 100 bees in your house. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't bring them inside. There's no need to. They are adapted to live in cold weather. Um, they're native to Alberta. They know, um, they know how to survive the winter. Um, so yes, don't bring them inside. Uh, Elizabeth, I was told to winter the mason bees in a jar in the fridge. I will talk about why harvesting cocoons is not super great in just a minute, um, but yes. Bees in Alberta are adapted to live um, in even negative 30, so there's no reason to bring them inside. Um, and then there was a question from Carol. Might any other insects use the bee hotel, um, i.e. something I wouldn't want? Uh, yes, so you will also get solitary wasps nesting in the hotel, and solitary wasps are not bad. Um, we all have well, lots of people have negative ideas of wasps, of course, because they're very aggressive. Um, but solitary wasps are similar to solitary bees um, in that they're not aggressive because they have nothing. They, they don't need to protect anything. They don't, 
they're, they're not aggressive, they're much smaller. So solitary bees and solitary wasps are both very harmless um, and will use the hotel and that's okay. They don't, um, they don't prey on uh, the bees or anything like that. So it's okay if you have the solitary bees and wasps both using your hotel. Um, other insects can inf <clears throat> infest the hotel. Um, that's possible and that usually happens um, when you're not cleaning it out. Um, so I will talk about maintenance a little bit further on in the presentation here um, and uh, about how to keep it clean so that it doesn't get infected um, with other pests or disease. Um, I had, I have a, well, the Land Trust has a bee hotel up um, in southwest Edmonton um, at the Larch Sanctuary, if anyone's heard of that or been there. Anyways, it's uh, it's just off of Rabbit Hill Road. Um, it's a beautiful place, kind of in the White Mud Ravine area. Anyway, they have a bee hotel up there, and there is a really big spider that lives in the bee hotel, um, kind of just in one of the openings between the blocks. And uh, he, uh, at first we were really concerned about the spider living there. We're like, well, he's gonna go in and eat all of the baby bees. Like, this is not great. But uh, over our lunch break, we were sitting by the hotel um, and we're watching this spider. And the spider would actually, um, he would just stay inside of his web. Uh, but then there were ants crawling up onto the bee hotel and the ants were trying to harvest the eggs and eat them. Uh, but the spider would actually pop out and grab the ant for his own dinner. Um, so I thought of the spider as more of a protector of the bee hotel than anything. It was, um, it was very obvious that he was not interested in the eggs at all. And that was the case throughout the whole summer. We didn't see any evidence of um, it going into the, the tunnels um, to try and eat the eggs. It was actually protecting the eggs from the ants. So... Um, yes, it's possible that other insects will use the hotel. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you have too many gaps between the blocks, so you can see there's little gaps here, um, we actually recommend filling in those gaps with paper straws um, because paper straws can be used as a tunnel for the bees. They don't prefer it, they prefer the wood because it's more natural for sure. Um, but if you fill in those gaps, it'll mean that it's less likely for other creatures to crawl in here. Um, we had a bee hotel up once that had really large gaps um, between the blocks and we had a squirrel who decided to make his stash uh, behind the blocks. And uh, yeah, so just make sure it's all tightly packed in there. Monica asks, will you be talking about the placement of hotels, i.e. sun, shade, height, etc.?" Yes, I will. I'm going to move on to the next slide here. Okay, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how bee hotels work um, because it's, it's kind of a, a mystery for some people. So on the top I have um, a graphic, I guess, well, kind of a diagram. It's a real life diagram that um, we made at the Land Trust to explain how the bee hotels work um, in a simple way. And then on the bottom, there's a picture of an actual bee hotel um, in use uh, and what that looks like. So um, the first thing I want to point out, I'll use my mouse here so you can see, um, is that every single egg lives in its own little cell. So I like to explain this as each egg has their own bedroom and the mom makes sure that they have everything in the bedroom that they need. Um, so for example, the mother will lay the egg, but then she will go to get pollen and nectar, which is indicated by these uh, little yellow pom-poms here, the little pollen. Um, so she'll surround the egg with the pollen and that's how they're able to grow um, through the winter. Um, they're able to absorb that um, the nutrients from the pollen. And then she also lines the entire cell um, with the material. So depending on the species, it could be leaves, it could be um, dirt, it could be wax. It really depends on the species. For example, if it's a leaf cutter bee, they will definitely use leaves to um, line the tunnel. And then they also use it to make a bedroom door. So um, they do line the entire outside to kind of keep the egg protected and warm. It's 
So I call that the blanket and then they use another piece of leaf to make the bedroom door. Um, and every single egg they lay has, um, has their own cell or their own bedroom um, and they could lay up to 15 eggs. Um, usually, so the one that you see here, um, they can only lay a few in there because they pack so much stuff into there. Um, so these ones, you can see this one has five and then the mother just added a whole bunch of front doors <laughs> to the entire um, bee nursery. Um, and then it looks like from what we're, we were able to tell, it looks like this was the same mother um, in the cell right above it uh, that she laid a couple more. So that's how the bee hotels work. They, uh, they basically make bedrooms for every single egg they lay which is a lot of work and that's why it can take them even a couple months to finish laying all of the eggs. Any questions about that? One thing that uh, I like to talk about, I'll just uh, give people a second to write any questions if they have them, um, but one thing I like to point out about um, the way that the mother lays the eggs is that she actually knows if she's laying a male egg or a female egg. Um, so she puts all of the females in the back closest to the back of the tunnel and then she puts all the males in the front. So when they hatch in the spring the males will hatch first um, and they have usually about a week before the females hatch. Um, so I like to call that uh, the male bachelor party before all of the females uh, hatch out of the nest as well um, and start the cycle all over again. Okay, how can you tell if your bee hotel is being used? So you saw in the last slide, it's easy to tell when you have a cross section of the tunnel, but uh, bee hotels don't usually have a cross section <laughs> to be able to tell. Um, so you can tell by looking at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> so in this picture here, you can see that some of the tunnels um, are clearly empty and some of the tunnels have a cap at the end of the tunnel. So I call that the front door. Um, depending on the species of bee, some of them like this one up here is using <clears throat> what looks like a it looks like wood chips to me, um, so they probably uh, used some kind of mulch or other, you know, wood-like substance. Uh, whereas if you look down here, we've got some kind of a waxy material, and lots of times the solitary bees can actually produce that. They have, um, they have glands um, that produce this waxy substance. And then other ones, like over here, this is um, very likely a mason bee that uses dirt uh, to fill the tunnel. Um, so that's what they use to both line the cells of the eggs, and then they use that for the front door to cap off the tunnel. And the reason they cap off the tunnel is to protect it from predators. Um, so there are some parasitic wasps that will come by and... Uh, and try to get into the hotel to eat the eggs because of course that's a really easy source of food for them. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they will work very, very hard to um, make sure that, um, that they cap the tunnel well. Uh, Carol asked, what is the white in the tunnels? Um, so I assume you're talking about how there's kind of like a white lining there. Um, and that is parchment paper. It is very optional and there is no evidence for or against using parchment paper to line the tunnels. The intention behind the parchment paper, um, so all, all you do is um, take a piece of parchment paper the length of the tunnel, uh, you take a pencil and you kind of roll it up um, into a tunnel shape and then you put it inside of the hole. Um, so the intention behind that is to make cleaning really easy. Um, so once they've hatched in the spring, yes, regular, regular cooking parchment paper, exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, they, uh, once the eggs hatch in the spring, you just have to pull out, um, the parchment paper using, like, tweezers, um, and then that takes out all of the debris with it, 
Um, so that's a really, really easy way to clean the tunnels. Sometimes they don't like the parchment paper. Sometimes they'll avoid it because it's not as natural um, as the, the wood that, uh, that it would be otherwise. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's no evidence really for or against the, the use of the parchment paper in there. It does take a whole long time <laughs> to fill every tunnel with a parchment paper tunnel. Um, so I don't tend to do that, but I know there's lots of people who want to make it easier in the spring, so they do. Um, I'll tell a fun little story about um, a leaf cutter bee that was in uh, one lady I talked to in her yard. She had a leaf cutter bee uh, that was filling up the tunnels um, and would cap the end off with a purple sub substance. And we were like, I don't know what that could be. Like, it couldn't be a purple uh, petal off of a flower or anything. Like, it was vibrant purple and it was um, very, the, the texture wasn't right to be a flower. Um, so we're like, I'm not sure what this could possibly be. Um, and it turns out her kids had left some purple construction paper on the patio table and the bee had gone and cut tiny little pieces of the construction paper out and was using that to line the tunnel um, and to cap it off. So that was why the tunnels were capped with purple. Um, Michelle asked, how do you know when the bees have, hat have hatched and when to clean the hotel? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the first thing to consider is um, how warm it is in the spring. Um, so this spring, for example, like yesterday was 20 degrees, they're going to start to hatch right about now. Um, so if they haven't hatched already, they'll be hatching very soon. Um, and the way you can tell is because the bees will actually go, I'll use my mouse here, um, so they'll go to the end of the tunnel and they have to actually push the, the end cap off to get out of the tunnel. Um, so once that end cap is pushed off, you'll be able to see that, of course, and then I wait a week from then, sometimes two. Um, and once it's been a week since they've popped that end cap off, you're pretty safe to uh, go in there and clean. I hope that answers your question. Rose said, very industrious little bees. Yes, they really are. It's a real phenomenon, in my opinion. Okay. So I'm going to uh, just briefly talk about what makes a good bee hotel. Um, for those of you who are looking to purchase one or to make one, uh, as I mentioned, I will send out some blueprints to everyone um, at the end of the workshop um, so that if you would like to make your own, you have the, uh, the resource to be able to do that for Alberta bees. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, why there are certain types of bee hotels that you shouldn't by. Um, so one thing that you should have is removable blocks. Um, so being able to actually take, I'll, uh, I'll just get this piece of help here. Um, so these blocks here should actually be removable. Um, and that's because um, you want to be able to take them out to clean them. Um, and then when they do eventually rot, you can just take the blocks out uh, drill new blocks and keep using the same frame. So essentially your bee hotel is good until the entire thing rots. So it could be years. It's a very, it's a, it's a good investment. I mean, they last a very long time. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's one thing to consider. Make sure you can remove the blocks. Um, another thing to consider is uh, having small hole sizes. So again, I'll, uh, I'll send out the blueprint um, with the, the sizes to use for the drill bits. But you can see again in this hotel, um, let me put my finger there for reference, the holes are quite small. Um, so think if a honeybee or bumblebee could fit in there, it's too big. Um, so you're gonna wanna make them much smaller so that a bumblebee could not fit their fluffy little body inside. That's just because most of the bees in Alberta are super small um, and 
um, the reason that you don't want to have those big tunnels uh, like the the large bamboo um, which kind of goes back to um, the the comment I made about how the Costco B hotels are not super ideal for Alberta um, is because they use that really big diameter bamboo uh, stock. The reason that's not ideal is because the bees are so small, um, they have to work really hard to, um, to be able to fill up that tunnel with material and to um, cap the end off. So the bigger the tunnel they find, the more material they have to, um, the more material they have to be able to cover uh, to keep the bees safe. So it's a lot more energy for them to nest in a bigger hole. Um, and that's why it's not ideal for the bees in Alberta. Does that kind of make sense? I know, um, I know that, I think it was Michelle was saying that, I know, maybe not, someone. Someone was saying they have the Costco one. Um, and that it's been super successful. Yeah, Michelle. Um, yeah, she was saying she has a Costco hotel and that it is successful, which is really awesome. You have really hardworking bees in your yard, um, but lots of bees are not willing to put that work in and that's why they won't use it. Um, so they're energy efficient. They are, I mean, some people say they're lazy because they're not willing to, to fill up all of that space, but it's just because, um, they're, they're trying to conserve energy and that's why they don't like those bigger holes. So we recommend the smaller ones. Um, okay, um, the tunnels, I will get to these two questions in just a minute. Um, the tunnel should be at least four inches long. We recommend between four and six inches actually. Um, the longer they are, the more eggs they can lay in one tunnel, which is really important. Um, as I mentioned, it's not it's not super, it's not a super big deal if, if they're only four inches, you know, they'll, they'll lay some in the adjacent hole as I talked about earlier. So that, that works out, no problem. Um, and then the tunnel should be closed off at one end. So if we go back to look at um, the picture uh, here, you can see that the hole isn't drilled all the way through. There's about a centimeter at the end here um, that is capped off so it, it uh, it's more comfortable for the mother bee uh, because she doesn't have to make an end cap. She also feels much more comfortable that the eggs aren't going to fall out the other end too. Um, so making sure that one of the ends um, is capped off in your tunnel is good. So don't drill all the way through if you're making your own. Um, and then to address your question, Carol, um, why not cedar? Cedar is a natural insect repellent, um, so they don't like cedar. Uh, we use pine. First of all, pine is super cheap, uh, so that helps, uh, but also because pine, that's a natural, uh, a natural wood that they would nest in anyways. But yeah, cedar is an insect repellent, which is why it is often used for uh, bird nesting boxes. So lots of people have cedar cedar bird boxes um, and that's good because then you keep the, the insects out of that. Um, one second here, lots of questions, which is great, thank you. Um, Monica said, can you attract different uh, species of bees with different hole sizes? Yes, you can. Um, so different species will use different sizes for sure. Um, looking at what you're trying to attract um, is a good idea and the size of that bee. Um, so if you're looking to attract leaf cutter bees, you'll need a slightly larger size hole. Um, whereas if you're looking for mason bees, they can be, they can be a little smaller. Um, so just depending what you're trying to do. I, I tend to just do a variety. I don't really, I'm not targeting one species in particular that I want, but I do a variety of different sizes of holes and that will attract different species of bees, which you'll be able to see based on the end caps that they use. <clears throat> Monica also asked um, if you can use birch or aspen. Um, you can, you can use anything else, just cedar is an insect repellent. Um, 
Teresa said, do any bees leave the tunnel in the fall? I have some holes that were covered in the summer and then empty in the fall. Um, usually that's because of predators. Usually it means that a parasitic wasp or some other type of insect has come and eaten the bees. So sorry for that sad answer, but <laughs> that's the reality of it. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, lots of bee hotels have, um, they, they call them multi-insect habitats. Sometimes they'll call them insect houses, insect hotels, and they have different um, kind of uh, areas for different insects or what is supposed to be for different insects. Um, and the reason we don't want to do that uh, is because having many different insects leads to a lot of um, a lot of preying on one another. So um, having pine cones in there, bees will never use pine cones. They have no use for pine cones whatsoever. Um, so you'll get other things nesting in the pine cones, mites, ants, other not appealing or uh, desirable um, insects in your hotel. Um, so just sticking to uh, having either the, the wood blocks or straws is much better um, because then you don't you don't risk other insects moving in which causes a lot of a lot of problems um, they are trying to eat the eggs they're um, they're easy easy food sources okay um, so now we're going to do a little bit of an activity uh, with the characteristics I just talked about, I would like you to type in the chat box um, what you think is wrong with this hotel. There are some good things about this hotel and there are some not so good things about this hotel. Um, I'll give you a couple minutes here to give me some different answers. Yep, I see bees don't use pine cones, holes are too large, uh, large bamboo, too many gaps. These are great answers. Yep, large bamboo with too much space between, not enough energy efficient to cap. Yep, perfect. Holes too large, excellent. Okay, um, and you can't really see um, in this picture, but I'll show you here. I actually have that hotel here. Um, so here it is. Um, if you look, the uh, depth of the hotel is not very, not very deep at all. Um, it's actually only about three, three inches deep, which is not very long um, for the bees. Again, it's not a huge, huge deal because they will lay in multiple tunnels. But ideally, you would want something a little bit deeper um, so that they're able to lay more eggs in one tunnel. Um, so thank you everyone for participating in that um, exercise. That's absolutely right. Um, all of these bamboo tunnels down here are very, very large. There are some that are smaller that I think would be just fine. Um, but for the most part, these, these really big openings here are, uh, are just too big. It's not energy efficient enough. Um, up here, this is a, uh, a pest haven, um, so this is not great. Um, these ones here are actually quite nice. I would leave these alone. Um, I would probably fill in the gaps with straws. Um, as uh, Elizabeth and Jana were saying, um, the gaps in between, uh, that could lead to pests, but if you fill those in with paper straws, that would be great. Um, would I buy this hotel? Sure. It's kind of cute. I like the hexagons, but I would have to make modifications for sure. Um, so even there's, there's some people who have no success with the Costco hotels, but they love the design and I'm with you. It's very cute. Um, but what I would recommend is actually going in and taking out all of the bamboo um, and then just making your own blocks and putting them in there because then you get to keep the frame. You get the cute little hexagon frame. Um, but then you have um, a hotel that's actually efficient for um, Alberta bees. So yeah, you could. You could definitely modify this uh, to make it perfect for Alberta species. Okay. 
So where can you get a hotel that's better for Alberta bees? Well, you're in luck. Wild Birds Unlimited is making some bee hotels. So if you're in need of one, um, we're gonna have them on sale for $29.99. Um, we are doing pre-orders for them. Um, so if you would like one, please get in touch with us. We'll put you on the list and uh, we will have one made up for you. Um, this is a really good price for a bee hotel, um, especially one that's made for Alberta bees. Um, in the picture here, you see that there are some gaps, uh, but the completed bee hotels will have lots of paper straws um, available to pack it all in tightly um, so that the, the blocks don't move around and so that there's not that gap for pests. Uh, Jana says, I have seen information that you should move hotels to a shed or garage for the winter. I assume that's a myth. Um, yes. <laughs> At least here in Alberta, we don't recommend that you move them um, inside at all because uh, they are adapted to live in the cold weather. Um, and giving them somewhere warmer uh, will make them think it's spring and they will hatch. Uh, so yes, don't bring them inside. Rose says, mine is on the fence post for the whole year. Yeah, that's, uh, that's probably good. <laughs> Thank you. Are you going to explain how to clean them? Yes. In my FAQs. Okay. Um, before you leave today, can you cover how to clean the holes if there's no parchment paper? Yes, on it. Okay. Um, that's the next slide, I promise. Okay. When should I put my bee hotel out? Um, in May or June. Uh, because this is when the bees are starting to look for a nest. So now is a really good time. If you don't have a bee hotel already, now's a good time to buy one and put it up uh, or a good time to make one because everyone's stuck at home. So why not, uh, why not build your own? Um, so yes, now is a really good time to start putting them out. Where should you put your bee hotel? Um, yeah, you should put your bee hotel on a tree or a fence post. Um, I usually put them on fence posts because lots of times there's not trees big enough to mount them on, but it's up to you, of course. Um, you should have them four or five feet off the ground. Um, if they're too close to the ground, they're susceptible to predators. If they're too high, the bees won't find them. Um, and then it should face east or southeast because you want it to get the morning sun. Um, that's really important, especially in the winter time. Um, so they are able to survive the winter, but it really, really helps if they're facing east or southeast. Um, so I hope that answers um, some questions that were asked before about uh, placement. Um, I already talked about how you should leave them outside, otherwise you're gonna have a fun little swarm of bees in your home, which is not great. Okay, next. Um, again, I've talked about how um, bee hotels are a good investment. They will last until the wood rots, as long as you clean it out each year. So here is um, some information about how to clean it. So again, you have to wait until they've hatched out. So they will pop that front cap off and then wait one to two weeks from the time that you notice that the top has been capped off uh, or pushed off, I suppose. Um, and then you can go in with either an air compressor, so you know the, the attachment to the air compressor that's kind of like a needle. Um, you can put that in the tunnel and just blow all of the debris out, or I really like to use a pipe cleaner. Um, so just a regular crafting pipe cleaner, um, you know, fuzzy metal, metal uh, wire through the middle, and just go in there and clean them all out. Because just like humans, bees do not like staying in dirty hotels. <clears throat> um, I see a question from Tim that says, can the hotel be placed on siding of a house? Yes, it can. Um, you don't have to worry about them building any kind of hive or anything. That's not a problem. Um, if you are putting it on the house, I would just uh, make sure that it is facing east or southeast, particularly because there is the overhang of the house and you don't want it to get shade all the time. Jana said, so no kind of bleach mixture like with birdhouses. Correct. Super dangerous for the bees. All you need to do is the pipe cleaner. Just get the debris out of there. Um, that's really all you, all you can do um, without harming them. Um, 
And then you can replace the blocks from your B Hotel, I don't know, every five years or whenever you feel um, the wood is starting to rot uh, or isn't um, able to be cleaned successfully anymore. Sounds so much simpler than what I've read. Yeah, it doesn't have to be difficult. I mean, they, they will use the hotel. We've had hotels up for many years and they come back year after year as long as we clean them. Um, no bees have moved in. What do I do? This is a common question. Um, sometimes it's because you put the bee hotel up too late. So people will say, oh, I put my bee hotel up last week and it's mid-August. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's, <laughs> that makes sense why none have moved in. So sometimes they, it's a timing thing. Other times it's a location thing. Um, so just try putting it in a different spot. They just need to find it. And once they do, they'll keep coming back. I think I have one more page of FAQs. Uh, can I build my own? Yes. Um, the Land Trust has a really great resource for building them, um, so you can use that. I'll also send out those blueprints I was talking about after, after the meeting. Um, I think I explained this earlier why I call it a bee hotel and not a bee house. Uh, bees don't actually live in the hotel. Um, they just lay their eggs there, so it's really only a temporary uh, place for the bees. That's why it's a hotel. Um, really the best name for it would be a bee nursery because that's what it is. The bees are laid there and um, developed there so that's probably the best name for it. Uh, bee hotel I guess is just kind of catchy. Some people call them bee condos but again they don't live there so. <laughs> um, I've heard of people harvesting cocoons. Should I do that? So that kind of ties into that question um, earlier about um, Oh, I should put them in a container and put them in the fridge. Um, there are harvesting companies that, um, that will grow and sell bees. Um, so you could, uh, you could buy bees from different companies to try and attract them or, well, you're literally putting them in your yard, so you're not really attracting them, but there are companies that do that, um, but they are trained to be able to remove the cocoons without harming them. Um, cocoons, when I say cocoons, it just means the, the cells that we were talking about, the little bee bedrooms. Um, I don't recommend it at all because it's, it's very risky. Um, one wrong move and you can, you can harm the bee and harm its development. They aren't harvested in the wild, let's put it that way. They, they grow and hatch in the spring without anyone touching them. Um, the only reason people harvest is to sell them. So I would say, please avoid that if you can. Mildred said, is it useful to put out scrap paper to use as material for bees? Um, so kind of uh, tying back to that story from earlier, the, may, or the leaf cutter bee that was using purple construction paper as a material. You can. Um, there are lots of natural materials for them in the summertime. Uh, leaves, um, debris like just sticks, twigs, um, dead leaves from fall. So I mean you can. It doesn't, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Apparently it did for that little bee who used the purple construction paper, but for the most part they're able to find their own sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is your, um, <laughs> it might make for a very colorful bee hotel. Yeah, put out different colors of scrap paper and uh, see how your bee hotel turns out. That'd be pretty cool. Um, this is the chance uh, for any other bee hotel questions. Um, I'm going to go in and talk about uh, native plants and how to attract, uh, attract bees with um, using native plants and other plants. So if you'd like to um, just keep listening for that, I will be going in depth on um, how to, how to um, optimize your garden um, for, uh, for pollinators, uh, bees and other you know, butterflies, moths, things like that. Um, but yes, any other bee hotel questions, I will um, wait one minute, uh, mostly because I need water. Um, and also to give you time to write a question and then we're going to move into the flowers and garden section.
Um, Jana said the plastic bee hotels are a no-no. Plastic isn't a natural material for bees, so they tend to avoid it altogether. It's slippery, um, so they're like, this is not like wood, this is not natural for me, it doesn't, my bees don't feel safe, um, I don't really want to nest here. Um, if it's lined, I've seen some plastic bee hotels that are lined with either paper or cardboard, that is super helpful um, and could be, depending on the size of the hole, could be successful. Um, so I guess to answer your question, maybe they might work depending on the design. I also had a question about um, buying bees online, uh, like buying eggs or buying clay um, for, for the bees to use. Um, so again, as, as in terms of the material that they use, it's kind of like when you put scrap paper out, it, it could help them. But for the most part, if it's a bee that uses clay or dirt um, to make the hotel, uh, they're going to find it on their own. They're not going to need that additional clay. You're, you're really just making it easier for them, and they are energy, energy efficient. They try and conserve energy. So possibly putting out clay or, or scrap paper might help them, but they, they really are adapted to use natural materials. <clears throat> um, the other question about should you buy bees or eggs online? You can. Um, just be cautious about where they're coming from. Um, if you're buying like mason bees, for example, that's the most common one, make sure they're coming from Alberta. Um, if you're buying them from, you know, Eastern Canada even, or, you know, the United States, anywhere else, be very cautious because then you're introducing a different, a non-native species, which uh, is not great. Uh, Teresa, I saw a bee hotel that had a removable wood cover on the front with two half inch open slots running vertically. Okay, um, that sounds to me a lot like a butterfly house um, where it has like a, a solid wood front and has slits kind of cut into it. Um, butterfly houses are not effective. There's been a lot of research done on them and they're less than 10% effective. Um, butterflies don't usually nest in there and it can cause lots of um, pests. Uh, so yes, I would say based on the description, if there's no actual like tunnels, um, like single tunnels, I would say that's probably not going to be sufficient for them. Um, Jenna is talking about uh, the plastic bee hotels, I think. We use them one year and put the covers on the outside that they recommended. Oh yes, yeah, because some bee hotels um, give you like stickers to put on the end um, after the bee has put their own natural cap on there. Um, and uh, it's a problem uh, because as Jana says, in the spring, the bees weren't able to move the covers and died because they were trapped. Um, so yes, uh, if you have a bee hotel and they say, oh, put this, this little uh, sticker on the end, don't put the sticker on the end because they can't push that off. It's not a natural material for them. It's too stuck, they can't get out. Um, so yes, that's like such great information. Thank you for sharing, Jana. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go into the flower section. Um, I'm happy to answer more bee hotel questions um, in the chat or um, always feel free to email me. I love talking about bees. Um, so any other questions, feel free to ask. Uh, but I do want to move on to the flowers because I know not everyone has <laughs> hours and hours to talk about bees. Okay, so pollin pollinator friendly plants. This is a shorter section, um, so we, we are getting close to the end here. Um, okay, so native plants for pollinators. Um, so why is it that we encourage so strongly plants that are native to um, Alberta and not other plants like we, we can buy at a garden center, uh, annuals and perennials? Um, the reason we recommend specifically planting native flower species is for two reasons. Um, first, bees are more effective at pollinating these plants. Um, they are literally built to pollinate native plants. That's their, they have adaptations to pollinate these plants. They're uh, physiologically um, designed to pollinate native flowers. Um, so that's the main reason. Second reason is because um, it's helpful for the ecosystem as a whole. 
Um, so planting native flowers is really important, um, especially in cities where really we have turned it all into grass. Um, there's not a whole lot of native uh, diversity, uh, except for in parks, really. Um, so having native plants in your backyard is really important um, for ecosystem health. <clears throat> so there have been lots of questions. I got some questions before the meeting also about what species to plant. Um, so I have a few, uh, this is my, I guess, top six recommendation. <clears throat> I know Teresa was asking me if I had a top 10. Nope, but I have a top six. <laughs> um, so here are some of my favorites. I really like giant hyssop. So giant hyssop is, let me just go back for a second. It's this beautiful, tall, purple plant, super tall. So if you are planting it, put it in the back of the garden so it doesn't um, overcast over all of the other ones. Um, wild blue flax is really nice. It's a kind of, um, kind of looks like grass, but it has a nice blue flower on the end. Um, and then smooth fleabane is really beautiful. It, um, I don't have a picture of it here. Oh, maybe I do actually. Yeah, here we go. So smooth fleabane, if you can see uh, my picture here on the camera, it kind of looks like a daisy, but the petals are much thinner. Um, it's a really nice one to have. Low milkweed. I really love low milkweed. Um, it is a really unique flower. Uh, sorry. Hopefully you can see that. If not, very easy to look them up um, online afterwards. Um, that one's really nice um, for butterflies too. So low milkweed is um, actually the monarch butterfly's favorite. I'm not saying if you put milkweed in your yard, you're going to have monarch butterflies. Um, but I am saying the butterflies like them a lot. Um, they're very cool plants. Um, so those ones are really nice. They're very short. <clears throat> um, another nice one is Gallardia. Some people know it as blanket flower. Um, so it's just this one here, yellowy orange. And uh, you'll notice that lots of these are different colors. So we have like purples, yellows, blues. I like to have a wide variety. <clears throat> um, first, because it can attract um, different species um, of bees and butterflies, depending on what they prefer. Um, also, because bees are not attracted to red. I actually just found this out, um, that bees don't prefer red flowers. Um, they actually much prefer uh, pinks, purples, yellow, uh, and white. Uh, but bees are not really attracted to red. Um, so even some of the darker pinks are not super effective um, for them. They, you will attract other things like butterflies um, and moths, but the bees in particular, <clears throat> for some reason, don't love the red. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about is Meadow Blazing Star, which is just here. It might be my favorite one. Um, it's purple um, and it's really beautiful. It, uh, it's shorter than the giant hyssop, which is also purple. Um, and I really like it. It's a beautiful flower. Um, the butterflies really like that one too. And so you'll notice I put um, some months beside each of the plants. And the reason I chose this particular set of plants um, as my favorite is partially because I just like how they look um, and they're native plants and they're beautiful and they're easy to grow, um, but also because um, there's a variety of when they bloom throughout the year, um, throughout the season at least. Uh, so um, I like to have some that will bloom in, you know, early, early June, even late May, and then having some that will bloom even into August and September so that they have the food source all throughout um, the summer season at least because that's a, that's a big issue for them is finding uh, flowering plants um, throughout the year. Um, lots, of, lots of plants, as I mentioned, will bloom in June or July and then will die off um, a little bit later. So um, making sure you have um, a food source throughout the year is very important for pollinators. Um, I see a few questions coming in. Uh, Michelle said, are these perennials? Yes, they are. Um, most, 
if not all native plants are perennial. Some of them are biennials, um, so they only, they only bloom every two years. Um, but because they are native to Alberta, they will keep coming back year, year after year. Um, and I will talk about uh, seeds. I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, where can I get these? All right, Michaela, I've got them for you. Um, at Wild Birds Unlimited, we have all of these seed packages available. Um, every single one that I've talked about on the, the past slide here, um, we have seed packages <laughs> um, for you. They're $4.99, which is a really good price for native plant seeds. Um, and it's, it's really nice that we have them because usually you have to get them either directly from a supplier or um, some people will even harvest their own seeds and sell them. Uh, but yeah, we're really lucky that we have these in store. Um, again, to order them, call us, email us, whichever works for you. <clears throat> um, I also wanted to talk about a couple other resources um, available. Um, so the Edmonton Native Plant Group is phenomenal um, in terms of all things native plants. If you're curious about why isn't my plant growing properly, uh, what, what do you recommend for this type of uh, garden, yard? Um, they're really amazing. Um, they're volunteer run. Um, they have so much information about native plants. Um, so I was mentioning <clears throat> we do have the, the seeds available for sale. We actually got them from the Edmonton Native Plant Group. That's what they do. They'll disperse them to different um, businesses to sell. Sometimes they sell them directly. Um, and then they also sometimes have the actual plants. So they will have volunteers start the plants from seed and then they'll sell the plants um, when they're slightly bigger so that you don't have to start them from seed, which is helpful. Um, but if you are looking to plant native seeds, I would say get on it now. <clears throat> um, it's not too late. You can for sure, um, pardon me, you can for sure, um, still plant them now and have success, especially for those ones that bloom later in the season. Um, and then there's two publications that I really like that are super helpful. I'll show you here. Um, we have the Grow Wild, or Go Wild, they should have called it Grow Wild, um, the Go Wild booklet um, that the Edmonton Native Plant Group put together. It is amazing. Um, so it talks about just a second here. Talks about a whole bunch of different varieties of um, native plants. So this is the smooth flea bane I was talking about earlier. Um, it gives you some information about the plant, how to grow it, um, growing it from seed, collecting seed. It has so much really great information. I have one of these for myself um, and I love it. So if you're looking for one of these, we have them for sale at the store for $10. Um, the other nice one that I like um, not necessarily for uh, growing these seeds, but for um, when I'm out um, walking trails and trying to figure out what different plants are. The Common Wildflowers of the Edmonton area brochure. It has so many wildflowers um, and is really helpful in identifying uh, what you're seeing out there. Um, so they talk about um, what they look like when they flower. They kind of organize them by color. Super great. Um, so if you want one of those, they're a toonie. You can get them at Wild Birds. We, uh, we have lots in stock if you're looking for them. Uh, Mildred said, some of these seeds are a little start, hard to start, aren't they? Yes, they are, which is why some, um, some groups, um, including the Edmonton Native Plant Group, or there are some private uh, businesses, um, will actually start them for you and you can buy the plant from them. Of course, it is more expensive. Um, you're paying usually five or six dollars a plant, whereas when you buy a pack of seeds, you, you get lots, like 30. So um, it, is, uh, it is a little bit harder to do, but it's really worth it once you do get them into the ground and going. Um, Mildred also said, what about lupins? Lupins are usually further south in Alberta. Um, they're not super common here. Uh, they, are, they are native to Alberta for sure. Um, but they're not as common in the Edmonton region, uh, further south, central, um, and even uh, like far south, uh, Lethbridge, Calgary. 
they have much more, much more um, uh, abundance of lupins. Um, they're fine here for sure. There's, there's nothing wrong with having lupins here, um, but yeah, hope that helps. Okay, um, what about botanical plants? Does this mean that we shouldn't plant them or that they're bad for bees? No, not at all. Um, botanical plants are really great for bees too. Um, they are not um, as efficient um, pollinator. Uh, pollinators can't pollinate them as efficiently as native plants because as I said, pollinators are adapted to pollinate the plants that naturally grow in Alberta. Um, but that doesn't mean that annuals, perennials, you know, pansies, uh, all of the other plants that you can buy from the garden center, that doesn't mean those are bad by any stretch. They're still great for pollinators. Um, but as I said before, um, having native plants really helps the local ecosystem too. Um, so that's why we recommend it. <clears throat> um, one thing to consider when you're getting uh, plant, uh, plants like botanical plants from a greenhouse um, is that you should be getting ones that bloom throughout the year. Um, so not necessarily just um, all plants that are going to bloom, you know, in June and July and then they all die off for August. So trying to get ones that are going to be blooming at different times is really helpful for the bees. Uh, Okay, we're about to go into the third section, um, but I want to ask if anyone has any other questions about um, native plants, uh, pollinator attracting plants, anything like that. Mildred says, I've noticed bees really love Icelandic poppies. Yeah, <laughs> they do. I'll just give everyone a minute here to ask any um, plant related questions and then we're going to go into the gift card draw. Cecile says, I have tons of early blooming squirrel and have had many bees in my garden since middle of April. That's amazing. That's so great. So good to hear. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's really good that you have that really early blooming um, flowers. Um, having an early blue violet is also really great. Um, I know that uh, at my parents' acreage, there's lots of early blue violet and the, the bees just love it. So yeah, making sure you have those that bloom all through the season is probably the best thing you can do um, in terms of plants for bees. <clears throat> Anything else? To everyone for watching, I really appreciate the chance to um, share my passion with you. I really love the bees. I love talking about bees um, and about your guys' yards and experiences, and I'm really thankful that I got the chance to present to you today. Um, so yes, again, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, the information I have on the slide is for the store. Um, I do work at the store, of course, so um, if you're hoping to chat with me, you can catch me there. I'm there on Saturdays. Um, and then uh, you do have my information too um, from the email if you wanna get in touch with me personally. Um, I'm always happy to chat um, about, about everything, everything about bees. Uh, so thank you again. Um, thank you so much for all the comments in the chat. I really appreciate it. 